Wellesley, for some reason, is like the yeah, center. Yeah, that's of 13 and under. I worked on that project. It's for after school programs that work with young people up to the mm -hmm. age of 13. That's where it's regulated. Um, but once you start to talk about teenagers and high school land. students, like middle school students, it's only been the last 10 years that there's been a focus on really trying to standardize and create um, regulatory programming around what's happening with middle school kids, because before then it was younger. But high, anything that happens for high school folks, for teen centers, um, drop-in programs as they're named, recreation centers, even YMCAs. I ran a YMCA program for a long time. My teen program had no regulations that I had to follow, but I had, for my middle school program and elementary school kids, there was all kind of standards and policies that I had to follow from how I kept the place clean to what was my curriculum, to what was the health standards in the bathroom, to how many kids could be with one counselor. None of that exists in teen programs. And oftentimes, those programs for those 15, 14 and up, you have one person in a space with multiple young people, and it's none of that becomes standardized. So I agree, in that younger age, there's all kind of standards. But when you start to talk about this out of school time, and that's the frame that people were trying to use, there aren't, there isn't anything that standardizes any of that, or really the equity and the quality of that is not that. The other after-school issue in there is the co-optation by No Child Left Behind. Yes. Um, which the big the big federal funding stream basically gives you brownie points for aligning your after-school programming with your state standards around No Child Left Behind. So that a, a service that used to be about compensating and making up for stuff that wasn't happening during the school day is being used to do extended school day on the cheap. Very quickly, I, and there's another point that I wanted to emphasize that Marion made, which is related to the mental health uh, and, the, and the fact that there aren't enough services being provided to uh, our kids that are being exposed to some form of, form of violence. And, and there's a range of violence that our kids are being exposed to, and it's a form of trauma that they're not really being treated for, and it does have impact then on their abilities to function yeah. in, in, in all kinds of ways, yeah. whether it's employment, you know, furthering their education, et cetera. But the other point I guess I want to make sort of related to that is, that is that our kids are also experiencing, especially again our boys, emotional violence directly from the schools themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the whole way in which education is being presented to them and the breaking of their spirits and their psyche really constitutes a form of emotional violence mm -hmm. that totally sets them up for this school to uh, jail pipeline that you were talking about, Marcia. <clears throat> and so I think the idea not only of us, you know, promoting policies that stop that kind of emotional, first of all, acknowledge it, identify it, and stop it, but at the, and, and concurrent with that, providing, providing the mental support, mental health support. Because even culturally, we don't, you know, and especially boys, you know, that age, oh, we don't need mental health, or we don't need, you know, it, it, somehow it's sort of a stigma for them, and yet somehow to make that more culturally um, acceptable, I guess, you know, and, and provide those services in a way that's safe and really result in a healing so we can break that cycle because it's that perpetual experience that keeps them also trapped in that cycle. Oh, I just wanted to point out that there are real challenges around the subliminal communication that comes uh, with even the most innovative projects. We have a colleague who is running this arts program in the Alameda school system. And the arts program brings artists as practitioners into the schools, and it also a lot of it's uh, after school, uh, bringing a lot of rich cultural content and interactive with the students. And I was um, very interested, and I thought it was, I think it is a very powerful and very useful program. But I was talking to somebody about it, and they said, but you know, there's a real problem here because all of the paid staff in the school are white, most a lot of them are white women. And then the people of color who are these artists, or after school and they don't get paid very much and the students pick up on the kind of subliminal communication that goes with so you, you know it's like you're you have this content but then they're noticing which things the actual institution values versus things that are you know um, trying people are trying to say so I think it's also that other kind of dynamic that's going on 
Thank you, Don. Oh, go ahead. So the, I think for me, there's a there's a thread and a bridge between the gap of what happens for high school students. And one of the things that for me is also looking at the emergence of grassroots organizations that have been led by young people of color to fill the gap that and to push back on the challenges of what's missing in their communities from what's occurring in schools to what's not available um, in their communities for recreation centers or what's being the impact of the environment on their communities. And they have picked up the struggle themselves, right? And saying that we're going to figure out how to shift this and change this. In our developing policies, in oftentimes there's this expectation that in those spaces that they're going to fill the gaps of the mental health issues because they may be working around gun violence. And so those grassroots programs are often trying to figure out how do we pull in resources to the systems that, from the systems that are actually not supporting young people, but it's the only access points they may have. And so what does it mean in communities for communities to have to fill those gaps themselves and for young people themselves to have to fill the gaps um, in addressing those issues? As, as much as they may be doing it really well, there's still something missing that our there aren't policies or there aren't things in place that say we care enough about the 15 to 24-year-olds um, in a way that we're not trying to lock them up or send them to Job Corps. And I, I don't mean to dig Job Corps, but I have issues with them too. But just, you know, these alternative things that aren't necessarily building the quality of life for young people in the most productive way. So I agree with that, and yet I think it's like we go back to the school failure um, mm -hmm. as this fundamental mm -hmm. issue that then produces all these effects. Mm -hmm. And we've spent a whole bunch of time and a lot of money kind of chasing and remediating and trying to patch the effect. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, in a lot of my generation's leadership, social entrepreneurship leadership went into that and is in that. Mm -hmm. and. I feel like we're, we're chasing after the effect rather than really focusing with laser sharpness on what what is the cost of school failure, right. what do we need to do, like how, how honed in are we on that set of core functions and results. And so, you know, if a school has a robust intramural and collegiate competitive athletic piece, if a school has a robust music and arts curriculum, right, if there are robust student kind of governance dimensions in the school so that there is, you know, a civic pathway. I mean, there are all these things that we have jerry-rigged externally because they don't exist in the institutional space that we formally have to fulfill that. So I just worry about where we put the, you know, like where we put the downbeat. 